Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Foremost, I uh, must acknowledge Jim and thank him for enabling me to be part of the Uli program and for arranging these series of lectures uh, at this August in historical building. And equally, it's a matter of immense privilege and honor to engage with an audience who have extensive experience of life, possess wealth of wisdom, and significantly representing cultural diversity, lingual diversity, representing different regions and religious backgrounds. Dear participants, uh, prior stepping into the main topic of discussion and presentation, I feel the urge to emphasize that today's objective is not solely an imparting knowledge pertaining to a particular topic or discipline. This activity is to share an insider's perspective, to help in understanding Islam, and to enable you all to see how it influences over a billion people, making contributions to global culture and civilization. This is uh, even more significant for the fact that there is a constant stereotyping there is this tendency of ethnocentrism, of judging others and others' cultures by, their, by one's own standards. This is happening both in the West and in the East. We in the East, looking at the West, judging the West by our standards, which is not the right way. And the West, looking at us, judging us by their standards, it's equally questionable. Uh, so, as I earlier pointed out, I'm an insider. I must say and confess it, I'm not a religious scholar. I'm not a clergyman. In fact, as a researcher, uh, religion has been one of my research interests, and I have written about it. In fact, I wrote this uh, I call it a commentary, questioned the institution of clergy in Islam. The title of the article is Papacy in Islam, Where Did We Go Wrong? Mm -hmm. So we can uh, uh, have a detailed discussion in the Q&A about that if you are interested. Uh, but coming back to the significant diversity that is present over here. It reminds me a cherished tradition or saying of the Prophet of Islam, who at the time of signing the Charter of Medina with the Jews and Christians stated, I quote, let us find agreement in our shared similarities, unquote. We all here also share so much in common. And one of these is the quest to learn. So let us embark on the journey to learn about Islam from an insider's perspective. Let me show you what I'm having for the agenda. So I have uh, classified my presentation into three parts. In the first part, I'll be discussing what is religion and what is the Islamic perspective of religion. Then I'll try to explain what is Islam. And that I'll be explaining through the historical context, uh, the revelation of the Quran, the personality and character of the Prophet, and particularly how non-Muslim scholars, philosophers, statesmen see him. And then I'll be sharing about the fundamental principles of Islam.
So what is religion? Very uh, important question in the context of our discussion today. Throughout history, numerous theories have emerged attempting to e explain the origin of religion. Religious historians agree that re the concept of religion occurred concurrently in the development of human cognition. Now, this give uh, birth to an interesting question that how come a phenomena that took its birth at the time of human cognition be classified as detached from reason and rationality. And I'll be sharing my personal perspective. In my opinion, this seeming dichotomy stems from our selective understanding and interpretation of reason and rationality. We, because of the science educates us about, uh, science educates us to focus on what is physical, what could be physically, materially proven, and it has produced great results. But one of the consequences of this tendency is that it has edited out the sense of the spiritual, the holy. Karen Armstrong, an ex-Catholic nun, a reputed religious historian, she is of the view that religion is not about physical, uh, about metaphysics. Religion is not simply about philosophy. She explains the word faith we generally equate with the belief, that is to say, accepting certain propositions of a creed and consequently when we speak of religious people, we call them believers, presuming of they believe things is the main activity they take part in. But the word belief in Middle English was believe in, meant to love. In the later word, credo, she thinks has evolved from kodo, means to give one's heart to, to commit oneself. The Greek word pistis means trust, rather than accepting certain metaphysical notions. And therefore, it, according to Ms. Armstrong, religion is basically about doing things and behaving in, in a way that changes us at a profound level. Now, this view does coincide with the Islamic or Quranic way of religion. According to the Quran, religion is not merely a set of rituals or practices, but a comprehensive way of life that encompasses the relationship between human beings and their creator, as well as their interactions with fellow human beings. This we call in Islamic terminologies, hukukul ibad, Allah's the, the Allah's duties to the people, to, the, his, to his creations, and his creations right or Allah. And then, consequently, Allah's rights or his creations, and particularly the human species. And then, the mutual rights among human beings. It emphasizes the belief in the oneness of God 
the importance of spiritual growth in self-discipline, in the pursuit of justice and righteousness. Um, the Muslim belief is that all the prophets, the purpose of all the prophets sent to the earth was to establishing justice on earth. This leads us to our next point on the agenda, that is, what is Islam? Islam, one of the five prominent global religions, namely Christianity, with the following of approximately 2.1 billion adherents, followed by Islam, approximately 1.6 billion adherents, Hinduism with a significant presence of around 900 million practitioners, Buddhism with a community of approximately 376 million followers, Judaism of followers of 14 million devotees, and the rest, a significant, roughly 16% of the global populations are non-believers. Now, in order to understand Islam, Islam is one of the three mono, monotheistic, monolithic religions alongside Christianity and Judaism. In not only one of the three monolithic religions, it shares a significant theological and historical connections with Christianity and Judaism. Let's look into the historical context of Islam. Before the advent of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the situation in Arabia in general was bleak. For centuries, the Bedouin tribes of the regions lived in fierce competition with one another for the basic necessities of life. Vendetta and blood feud was the only way of censoring a modicum of social security in a region where there was no central authority, there was no political system, where every tribal group was a law unto itself, and where there was nothing come on of justice. The tribes were involved in constant warfare and were factually doomed to perpetual barbarism. The same made it literally impossible for them to pool their meager resources and become the united Arab people that they were dimly aware of being. Simply, they could not take their destiny into their own hands and found a civilization of their own. This is something very significant for you to remember to the events coming up. In fact, they were open to exploitation by the great powers of the time, the Persian Empire and the Byzantine Empire. As for religion is con concerned, the Arabs had a pagan pantheon of deities who they worship at their shrines, but they had no notion of afterlife. Instead, the tribal ideal had subordinated the individual to the group and insisted that a man or a woman's soul impartiality, Im 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 uh, immortality, sorry, immortality lay in the survival of the tribe. It is in this background that the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad peace be upon him, emerged on the scene in about 610 AD. Is the Prophet chosen by the same God who sent Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and all others is his prophets prior to Muhammad. And when he died in 1632, he had managed to bring nearly all the tribes of Arabia into a new united community, our Ummah. He had brought the Arabs a, a spirituality and a system that elevated them intellectually, 
socially and politically and within a short span of about 30 years they defeated the two great empires of the time and established their own great empire which stretched from the Himalayas to the Pyrenees in about a hundred years. This, is, this wasn't by any stretch of imag imagination a mean achievement. The Prophet born in Mecca in 6th century in the context that I just shared with you, you must keep in mind, you must take into account. In order to analyze rationally and impartially any notion, the context shouldn't be taken out of the discussion. And that's important. Karen Armstrong does, uh, in fact, has uh, referred to it time and again in her book, Muhammad, the Prophet of Our Time. How was the personality of the Prophet? Let's see the personality of the Prophet through how non-Muslim philosophers, thinkers, statesmen, historians see him. Michael Hurd, uh, who wrote about the hundred most influential people writes, I quote, My choice of Muhammad to lead the list of the world's most influential, influential persons may surprise some readers and may be questioned by others. But he was the only man in history who was supremely successful on both the religious and secular level. Unquote. Alfonso de Lamartine, a French poet and statesman, states, and I quote, As regards all standards by which human greatness may be measured, we may well ask, is there any man greater than he? River Boswith, late fellow of Trinity College, Oxford, he writes, I quote, he was a Caesar and a pop in one, but he was pop without the pop's pretensions and Caesar without the legions of Caesar, without a standing army without a bodyguard, without a palace, without a fixed revenue, if ever any man had the right to say that he ruled by a right divine, it was Muhammad. For he had all the power without its instruments and without its supports. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, the Indian thinker, statesman, and nationalist leader, he opens, and I quote, I became more than ever convinced that it was not the sword that won a place for Islam in those days, in the scheme of life. It was the rigid simplicity, the utter self-effacement of the Prophet, the scrupulous regard for his pledges, his intense devotion to his friends and followers, his intrepidity, his fearlessness, his absolute trust in God in his own mission. These and not the sword carried everything before him, before them and surmounted every trouble. Washington Irving, who is known as the first American man of letters, he described uh, covering the life both private and public of the Prophet pretty much in detail and in order to avoid uh, 
uh, your boredom I'll, I'll because I'll be sharing the slides with you I'll be uh, leaving it for you to, to read to go through but how Islam influences the lives of over a billion people Islam plays a significant role in shaping the lives of its adherents influencing their daily routine moral choices family dynamics community engagements it provides a source of guiding guidance offering answers to existential questions providing a moral campus and emphasizing the importance of justice duties personal accountability and human welfare recognizing the diversity within the Muslim community and the rich cultural canvas that Islam inspires is essential for fostering inclusivity and promoting interfaith dialogue in our increasingly interconnected world this this is meant to be achieved through the faith and practice of the fundamental principles of Islam so let's now investigate the fundamental principles of Islam how these fundamental principles seeks to impart and inculcate what it intends to Tawheed or the oneness of God is the first fundamental principle of Islam the oneness and unity of Allah is what Muslims believe in the belief is in the absolute monotheism of Allah or God recognize him as the one and only God without any partners or associates we express this uh, notion in the phrase la ilaha illallah and this phrase starts with first negating that there is any being there is any supreme being but only one and that's Allah that is Allah that is God the same God that Abraham uh, worshipped the same God that Moses worshipped the same God that Jesus worshipped this uh, concept of uh, belief in oneness of God it emancipates us from worldly gods it gives us absolute freedom in the true sense of the word how's that the belief that for example if I put in effort I work towards a particular objective purpose Allah has promised and Quran is the word of God and he is in the kalatu khli fil miyad he doesn't uh, uh, break his word he keeps his word and he has promised in the Quran that irrespective of whether you believe in him or you don't if you put in effort he will never lace your hard work your struggle your efforts wasted so you shouldn't worship status wealth position power you are being a human you are ashraful makhlukat this concept of ashraful makhlukat is this the the creation the the supreme creation of his creator and Socrates has defined philosophy uh, uh, in fact I should go up a little uh, in the background he says that wisdom is an attribute of the Almighty alone we cannot to be wise we cannot claim to be wise we can only be in love of his wisdom in this quest of in love of his wisdom of what manifests his wisdom that is how he defines philosophy to search for knowledge if the creator 
unbelief is a Muslim, is an insider. If I believe in the, uh, uh, him being the authority, I shouldn't be subservient to wealth, to position, to power. Because it doesn't mean Allah has promised and irrespective of whether you believe in him or you don't. There is this verse in the Quran and that very clearly states that وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَ بَنِي Adam That all the creation according to Quran, all this human, all human beings are the descendants of Adam and you. And Allah says, I confer dignity upon humanity. It's not about Muslims, it's not about Christians, it's not about Jews. Human beings being given dignity, respect, honor. So we human must respect humanity foremost. We shouldn't worship caste, color, creed, position. And that's where this concept of Tawheed, oneness, belief in oneness of God, emancipates us. Prophethood. When it comes to prophethood, the Islamic belief is that Allah being the uh, creator, he could have tasked prophethood to any of his creations, any of his creations, why he chooses men. Two, prove to man that the system that he wants men to establish on earth, that's very much possible. It's not only for the chosen ones, that's very much possible. 3,000, 4,000 years back as well as it's still in the 21st century, it's very much possible. And that is to establish justice on earth. To establish humanity on earth. To establish righteousness on earth. So, uh, Muslims believe in the Prophet Muhammad is the last Prophet of Islam. And Islam is not that Muhammad established. Rather, Quran has referred, Quran has used this the, the very expression of Islam and Muslims for the religions of all the prophets from Adam to, to Muhammad. So Muhammad only was at the climax of Islam. He wasn't the one who established Islam. That's our belief. We believe in all prophets from Adam to Muhammad. Muhammad is uh, uh, put the seal on the prophethood. He was the last of the prophethood. That's what we believe in. Muslims also accept and respect earlier prophets. Abraham, Moses, Jesus, the rest. And we, do, we consider them all as important religious figures in Islam. Quran is the book, the divine book given to the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, is the holy scripture of Islam and it is, is believed to be the word of Allah is revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. You know, it's a miracle that the Prophet was an illiterate man. He was not literate in the uh, rational sense of the word. And he came giving a book that was not his book, rather that was Allah's through the, the, the angel Gabriel. It serves as the ultimate source of guidance for Muslims containing divine teachings, ethical principles and laws for personal and societal conduct. Very, very importantly, Quran, as I said, we believe it's the word of God. And in the Quran, Allah never demands a blind belief in him or in the Quran. Time and again in the Quran, Allah says, and I quote, those who, who have reason 
and those who don't, they cannot be equal. And there are signs for those who use their reasons. Allah has challenged man in the Quran, if you can, prove. Yesterday I was watching this cliff of the Atlantic division between the, the, the oceans. Uh, you know, the, the two vividly clear different colors. Uh, 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 not uh, uh, mixing up with each other. Isn't it a miracle that 1400 years back, Muhammad, an illiterate man sitting in the Arabian Peninsula, he writes about it. This very, this very uh, idea, this very thing, referring to this particular happening. So this was the word of God. This wasn't Muhammad saying it. And Allah has asked men to rationally. This is how Muhammad, when he went out for the first time, uh, sharing about his revelation, he has received revelation. Uh, our belief is that he laid the foundation of the belief on a rational level, on a rational setting. The narrative he established was on reason. It, on logic instead of you know like a politician of the contemporary world asking people because of him being the son of so and so being coming from such a in such family they should follow him no he he didn't say that he asked the gathering what if he tells them that there is an army intends to attack. Will they believe? And the crowd unanimously responded, yes, we, we do. And he again questioned, why would they believe? And they said, and uh, Charles Lee uh, uh, Hazleton, uh, another Jew religious historian, she, uh, sorry, Leslie uh, Hazleton, she writes that he uh, was called Al-Amin, trustworthy. He was called Sadiq, uh, truthful by the people because he lives amongst the very people. And then he shared with them the news of him having received the revelation. Karen Armstrong writes that the, the experience Muhammad went through receiving the revelation was very much identical to the Hebrew uh, prophets that wasn't different from them. Salah is the obligatory ritual prayer performed by Muslims five times a day. Uh, this is according to our belief is or direct connection with Allah Almighty. The, the position, the situation where a, believe, a Muslim, an adherent of Islam, he can, uh, can interact with the, his creator, the Allah Almighty, that is in uh, 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 this ritual, uh, through this ritual. Uh, it has both uh, individual as well as societal benefits. Uh, in Salah, we, we stand beside each other irrespective of any differences or preferences of position or wealth or caste or color or ling lingual or cultural differences. So there's oneness shows that men, they are all equal. By putting a believer's routine according to a proper portion, uh, pattern of time, it serves discipline. It brings discipline. Five times a day, the first prayer of the, the day starts, it uh, uh, is performed 
get done. So, the believer needs to uh, um, get up early. You know, uh, uh, early to bed and early to rise. <laughs> so, so, for you to get up early, one requires to you know, get in. Uh, uh, get in the bed early and then to be able to get up early. So it brings that discipline in one's life. Along with Salah, Zakat is another notion that's been repeatedly uh, statisticians say that it's been uh, instructed about 700 times in the Quran alongside Salah. Zakat is charity. The mandatory of giving up a portion of one's wealth and the minimum is 2.5% to support the less fortunate and to purify one's wealth. So there is a detailed uh, uh, guide about it, how to give it, uh, what, what portion to give it. it just to briefly uh, say a few things. It is for the savings that you have for, for any year. So for, for example, if you have saved $100 for a year, and that $100 you're required to give 2.5. Only 2.5. <coughs> and that is the minimum. You know, there, there's no uh, um, uh, limits on how much you give. The more, the better. But the minimum is 2.5. Again, that is how to help. We've been told that if you give with the right hand, your left hand shouldn't know about it. And if you give with the left, your right hand shouldn't know about it. Should do give it in a manner not to hurt the self-esteem of the person. That's important. Psalm or fasting, uh, it refers to the observance of fasting during the month of Ramadan. You would have heard uh, many times about it. Uh, the Muslims fast for a month in the month of Ramadan. Uh, it's a month of a uh, whole, uh, a festive month. Uh, it has an entirely, you know, altogether different experience from the normal routines. Uh, the uh, Muslims fast from the dawn. Uh, till the sunset, they uh, don't eat, don't drink, uh, don't uh, get into uh, any physical uh, uh, requirements that they, they're supposed to um, fulfill uh, um, intimate relationship within this period of time from dawn to the sunset. And in this you could see in the pictures and the images that uh, we, we try to, to feel how the less fortunate going through the experience of hunger and not having enough. So to share with them, bring them, make them sit, sit beside you. And that would be anyone, Muslims or non-Muslims. Likewise in Zakah, I forgot to mention that you can give it to anyone. Any less fortunate, it's not about the religion. You can give it, you're supposed to give it. Hajj or the pilgrimage, the pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia, which is an obligatory act for physically and financially. It's important physically and financially capable Muslims. And at least once in their lifetime, it is only once in one's lifetime if they are physically and financially capable. If they are not, it's not obligatory on them. This again, this, this whole exercise shows, exhibits unity, equality, whether any king or statesman or layman any learned or illiterate, any skin color, anyone speaking any language, they 
wearing the same color, the same cloth, get into that congregation at the mount in Mecca. I have taken this clip from the, the movie The Message. Uh, and I hope uh, it was the only pilgrimage that the prophet, uh, prophet of Islam could perform. The only and the last one. And in this pilgrimage, it, this, this clip showing that uh, depiction of the pilgrimage of the last sermon of the Prophet delivered. So, I'm leaving it. God, 
let him know that God is alive and cannot die. They buried Mohammed beside his mosque in Medina. But the religion he preached found its place in the heart of man. It endured. It multiplied. Still to Mecca they come, mankind. The people of Islam dressed in their pilgrim white. All equal before God, all united in this place of prayer. Each individual soul joined in a community of worship. One God. These fundamental principles guide the beliefs, practices in moral framework of Muslims, providing a foundation for their spiritual and daily lives. Uh, with that, I come to the conclusions of the presentations. I'm eagerly looking forward to a very charged up Q&A session. Thank you very much. Do folks have questions? Um, Big Bald is willing to definitely. Yeah, I'm very much willing. Uh, um, and and, and yeah. you know, if you had thoughts during the presentation that you would like perhaps more explanation, um, you know, perhaps you have friends who are Muslim um, and you wondered about how they practice, you know. Um, what I love about my conversation with Big Bald is like he said he's not a clergy person. No, but he practices Islam, Islam, and so he's here giving his perspective on it. But I think he would love to engage you if you do have questions about the religion, about the state. Sure. Hey. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, your good name, please, and then uh, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, yeah. my name's Kate, um, and um, I, I felt like I was hearing about Jesus when hearing about Muhammad in, in a lot of ways, including the five times a day prayer, which is the divine office, which is done. Christianity. Um, but my question um, is with all of the different the pilgrimages and the prayer, and um, is there any type of meditation that is included in that prayer? And the reason I ask that is because it seems like um, well, of course meditation has always been big in the East. Um, it was many, in the beginning of Christianity, but it's been coming back for the last 20 years. Um, you know, contemplation, meditation, I think, you know, in this world of ours, um, the only way that we're going to be able to change anything is to change ourselves within. Very much and so. that needs Perfect. quiet and meditation and contemplation. So I'm wondering if there's a part of that in Islam. Okay. Uh, a, a, a very good question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, firstly, these fundamental principles were the obligatory principles. The demands that uh, uh, have been made f from a Muslim. Uh, these some of these fundamental principles do have uh, meditation uh, innately. For example, uh, Salah. Performing Salah. It should be performed in a manner uh, we've been told that you can see the Lord. You are standing in front of Him. But if you cannot have that feeling, at least you do know, you ought to know that he sees you. He can, you are there with him. Uh, but there is no uh, such thing as, you know, forbidden or restrictions on meditation. Uh, the Prophet used to spend the last 10 nights uh, of uh, 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 the month of Ramadan in the mosque. Uh, which is called uh, Masjid Dinabui, the, the mosque of Medina, the, the prophet mosque. Uh, I personally, I performed uh, six times, you know, spent the last 10 days of the month of Ramadan in the mosque. That is uh, um, uh, sitting yourself, placing yourself in a secluded place and, you know, uh, contemplate and meditate and uh, uh, do self-reflection and all that. Yes, that's done. So it's, it's very much there. 
a prefer a prefer uh, preferred ref, uh, uh, ritual uh, a preferred way of you know uh, even uh, someone who is you know i i define myself someone who is secular who is who's liberal but that it needs for self reflection as well yeah. i hope i uh, answered your, your your question thank you very much mm. yes i just wanted to make a comment that hebrew and arabic are similar and zakat is like the Hebrew word sadaka, hmm. which means charity. Yeah. So there are similarities. Um, uh, I, I, uh, perhaps I more than once mentioned that we Muslims, we believe that Islam is not something hmm. that the Prophet came and he established. Rather, it was the same religion uh, that continued from uh, the Prophet Aid um, to the Prophet Muhammad. And um, uh, in the Quran, in fact, we've been told for example, we've been told that you have to fast like the nations that the Lord demanded uh, to fast earlier than you, prior to you. Um, uh, Zakah is an obligatory uh, portion of wealth that we are supposed to give if we do have that. But uh, uh, we, we've been asked to give alms and sadaka. The, the word sadaka is very much an uh, in, in Arabic word, you know, uh, perhaps a word from Hebrew. Um, um, and we've been asked, uh, enjoined to, to do that, to give alms and sadaka. Uh, in fact, uh, in, in the first, uh, in the second surah of uh, Quran, we've been told that the best of the sadaka is to speak politely. Uh, I, I hope I answered. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, Martha, <laughs> I, I think that the connection between Abraham and Islam is more concrete than people realize. I think a lot of people realize how it's all connected. V very much so. Um, uh, 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 the very place that we call uh, Hanukkah, uh, the, 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 the square shape uh, uh, room, uh, uh, we believe that it was Prophet Abraham built along his son uh, uh, Ismail, we, uh, we call. And uh, likewise, uh, we celebrate uh, two uh, festivals, uh, one Eid we call after the, the month of Ramadan and the other one we uh, perform after the Hajj, the pilgrimage uh, and we do uh, um, um, uh, uh, a sacrif sacrificial um, ritual that is commemorating the, the, the episode that uh, the Prophet Abraham and Ismail experienced. So, but we believe that there is a connection not only with Abraham but all the rest of the uh, yeah, and uh, there is this descendants Muhammad uh, being from the Hashim family he was in the lineage of Ismail uh, Abraham's sons Ismail uh, whereas Moses in Abraham's sons uh, is uh, Isaac and all awesome. yeah so they serve. Sure. Uh, what role do women play? Uh, can you repeat the question? What role do do women play? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, in in Islam, uh, I was very much expecting uh, this question. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, in, in the beginning, if you uh, remember, I, I mentioned about ethnocentrism, being a student of political science, being a student of sociology, um, uh, various concepts, that judging others' cultures by one's own standard is a problematic thing. Uh, we, sh we shouldn't do. Uh, we should take into account context. And then we should avoid stereotyping. What the media tells us, Yes, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I claim myself a feminist. My work in the masters was on how religion and cultural norms uh, affect Pashtun women, being Pashtun ethnically, Pashtun women's electoral participation, their political participation. How religion and cultural norms restrict 
the political particip participation of women set aside Islam or, or Indian. In my results, my uh, conclusions of my research work, that it's not religion, it's not cultural norms, but it's how men construct structures in the form of religion, interpreting religion, presenting religion, presenting cultural norms in a manner to control the agency of women. The same men in that community, in the case study area, they don't mind allowing women to, to work alongside them in the fields, in the uh, e economy. For them, that's not a matter of honor. For them, then, it's not a manner, matter of religion. In fact, I was uh, interviewing uh, this clergy, this Molana, and he was telling me that Islam doesn't allow women to go out and all this and blah 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 and all that. And that's the reason we don't uh, support women's participation in election and uh, for them to vote. And when I countered the Molana, that Molana, your party, Molana is a pop, is a, is a clergy. Your political party, the, 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 the political party that you are supporting, from the region that you are part of, my case study uh, area, there is only one woman part, uh, member in the parliament and that represents your party. So why is this dichotomy, if religion doesn't allow, then why you do that? Why you have allowed that woman, one woman to, to represent your party? So it's a more a matter of using religion for one's wasted interest, rather religion itself. Let me tell you how Islam has uh, 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 liberated women and not in the 21st century but you know in, 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 the, in the time in the you know the brief history that I shared with you the, the, the little history that I, I, I uh, could able to, to share with you in Islam a woman has equal share in the uh, finances in the inheritance she has the share she receives from the father even if the husband is poorer than her and she is not willing to give the husband, it is the husband's responsibility to support her economically, not the woman, not the wife. She is uh, all <laughs> responsible and free for her uh, uh, whatever she has received from her, her father. She has shares in the husband's shares but the husband doesn't have a share in, in her share of the property. If she uh, uh, demands for, um, the, uh, from the husband the price for the, f uh, for the milk she beats her son, uh, her, uh, her child, her daughter, her son, he is bound to pay if she demands so. That is how Islam has uh, given her uh, uh, a right to that extent. It is more of a, uh, a political, economic, uh, the power struggle, the, the, the agency of men trying to control the, the agency of women through constructing structures, representing religion in a manner. The Muslims today representing Islam are not representing uh, Islam very much likely as Christians not representing true Christianity or for that matter any religion. So we sh you know, uh, I'll again refer to Karen Armstrong. You know, why I consulted uh, non-Muslim uh, historians, religious historians, to bring that neutrality instead of, you know, having a bias. Uh, yesterday, uh, sitting with Jim, I was telling him that at any stage of my life, fortunately for, to, for two things, for my academic background and my family background, I was lucky enough, I was fortunate enough to have that freedom. Uh, at any point, if I would have discovered that it's a farce, I would have uh, renounced it. You know, but I, I do question religion more than you would do my religion. I do question my religion as well. And the more I question it, I discover that, you know, no, there is a, there is a logical answer to it.
And as I said um, in my uh, presentation, that we should uh, we should we should uh, be careful about selective uh, rationality, selective reason. Anything that I cannot prove is not necessarily to be doesn't exist at all. Okay, James. What's the difference between your thinking about Muslim and um, Afghanistan Taliban thinking about the Quran? How how the difference between their thinking and your thinking? Okay, uh, their thinking and my thinking. Uh, it's not about their thinking and my thinking. If I could understand your question correctly. Uh, uh, it's more of a political question. Uh, your question is is based on a political situation. What happening? Uh, you know, as a student of political science, let me respond to that more than you know uh, having presented a topic on religion. I, I would like to present to respond to that on a political. Uh, this is more of a political issue, in my opinion. Just me. Yeah. Their thinking, their way of doing things in Afghanistan. They are saying a lot of uh, teaching of the Quran. And you are thinking different than what I see from them, what I read. So I don't know what uh, their. Who is right and who is wrong, you, you mean to say? I, I, Whether uh, 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 Taliban's are right or Iqbal is right, you mean to say? I'm not sure that's right this way or that way. Okay. But there is big difference between them and you. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, again, I'll, I'll say that's more, in my opinion, that's more of a political issue. Uh, in my response to the previous question, I said, how religion can serve me? How nationality, nationalism can serve me, my political interest? If religion can serve me by twisting it, by 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 molding it to my western to to to, uh, to enable myself to to serve my interest, then it's fine. Whatever I presented over here, that was primarily based on the Quranic explanations. One thing that is not a Baal's concept. Uh, that is based on Quranic explanation, and that is how scholars. Martha would uh, validate my point. Karen Armstrong is a very reputable name, an ex-Catholic nun. Uh, I'll recommend two books of hers. In fact, in one of her lecture, she said the Taliban committing the 9-11 episode, that is heresy in Islam. Why? In Islam, the Prophet has instructed about the war you shouldn't target civilians you shouldn't target elderly you shouldn't target innocents they did they, they did that was heresy then in the war there shouldn't be fire causing fire and killing people is again against the teachings of Islam the teachings of the Prophet so that's more any particular group Taliban or whoever that is they using religion nationality region a particular notion concept for their vested interest but the problem doesn't lie with the Taliban alone and this I'm not defending Taliban but getting into the the, the, the core of the issue what's happening how did it started uh, start happening in the 80s we were told that it's a fight, it's a war between the communists and the West. So the same people, who was Usama? Usama, a, 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 a young guy, a youth from the Middle East, he was picked up, he was trained in Pakistan, who funded the established, Pakistani establishment? And it's not like Baal saying it, it's Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State of the USA of the uh, United States who is saying the deep state in Pakistan the deep state in the third world and deep state in Pakistan it's the establishment the establishment funded by the powerful not only in Pakistan but in the rest of the third world 
They are funded by the powerful, the superpowers to serve their interests. And if a deep state, an establishment or whoever that is, that is serving your interest for wasted interest, how come you not expect them deceiving you tomorrow? <laughs> they will surely deceive you tomorrow. The same establishment deceived or played double game with the, the US. That's what the US says. Even currently, what's happening in Pakistan in my country, gross human rights violations. Uh, an elected government being ousted by the establishment, supported by the US. Because the US thinks the establishment can serve their interests. The same people were trained by a Pakistani establishment funded by the US. Were, after 9-11 we were told they are terrorists. Pakistan lost 80,000 people got killed. More than a billion dollar loss to the economy. I come from the very region, from the very place that suffered because of the, uh, the war on terror. This you said there is a difference between you and uh, Taliban. God forbid if any, uh, you know, and th this is something very frankly I'm saying. I don't know whether I'm supposed to say it or not. If any member of my family, get, God forbid, is getting killed, what, uh, what uh, remedy I'll be having to pick up the gun against the, the, the very people, isn't it? That is happening. Collateral damage. Innocent people getting killed from uh, um, uh, uh, from both sides the Taliban we have more against the Taliban than perhaps you be uh, you know uh, sharing with Jim in, in one of our sessions I was telling him that it's I'm lucky to uh, to sharing my views on religion over here in the US I cannot share the same views in the country, despite of there is this religious scholar Javed Ahmed Gandhi, who had to plead firstly to Malaysia because of him being labeled that the religion he is representing and he is trying to represent the true the, the religion close to the Quran. But who is sponsoring them? These these groups, the establishment. And who is uh, in the support? The powerful. For me, as a Muslim, as an insider, Taliban is not representing my religion. I am, Islam is my religion and uh, I am not a terrorist. <laughs> yeah. What's the, the principle to blocking God? That's against Islam. That's against the teachings of Islam. Islam against the teaching of Islam Islam has made religion uh, sorry education obligatory for every Muslim man and every uh, Muslim woman the very first uh, revelation the very first revelation that the Prophet received it's the word Iqra recite read it begins with the revelation of the Prophet that was given to the Prophet the very first interaction between the Prophet and the divine through the uh, angel Gabriel and the prophet was saying he, he felt Karen Omsan writes in her book uh, 4000 years of uh, Christianity Judaism and Islam she writes that the prophet son being illiterate he thought that it's probably a genie and the genie as used to be experienced by the, the poets in the in the, uh, the in the period so he is responding I'm I cannot read I cannot read and then she writes that he was embraced very he was literally enveloped by the, the angel Gabriel and he was asked recite how could a religion that is uh, asking that the, the, the very revelation begins from the word recite the word read uh, would ask uh, its followers of that women are not there is no distinction between religious knowledge or worldly knowledge or any of those things I personally believe that there is no such thing as worldly knowledge or religious knowledge knowledge is to know 
and Islam has made it obligatory. There is this uh, saying that if you have uh, left your home in the quest of knowledge, in God forbid, you die a biological death. Your death is more uh, it's, it's, it's of a superior degree than the one who has uh, uh, um, uh, sacrificed his life in the line of duty. It's more superior than that. So, education, uh, uh, Allah in the Quran says, those who know, who understands, who reason, who use their reason, intellect, they and who, who, who don't, they cannot be equal. How could? So the Taliban interpreting Islam in that manner, that's a very much cultural thing. That's got to do more with the culture or their wasted interests. That's why such uh, discussions are important. Mm -hmm. Such interfaith dial dialogues are important to understand it better, to break, to challenge the stereotyping. You know, whatever comes from the media, we should uh, try to uh, logically analyze things instead of you know accepting everything it's it's not like that I hope I answered yes yeah, sure oh, my name is Lil I have a basic question so if someone is required to pray five times a day can they do that in their house do they need to be in a group of people in a facility what are the rules okay so in Islam, uh, unlike Christianity, there is no such thing as far as the, the, the performance of the ritual is concerned. Uh, there is no such specifically, you know, this, it's not primarily you, you need to go to the church. If you have limitations for any reasons whatsoever, you can perform it anywhere. You know, I can ask someone requesting someone to, to provide me a place and I can perform my, my uh, midday prayer over here as well. But it, preferably, it's preferred to go to the mosque, to have that social networking, to see who is there, who is not. You connect with each other. That's preferred. But if you cannot do that for any reasons whatsoever, for, your, for, for health reasons, for the limitations of your, your time schedule, um, you know, it, it's fine for the five times. Uh, even uh, you know, um, there's, there's a bit more to the, to that. The prophet uh, uh, used to, if he, uh, for for example, he he got to uh, get on a journey, he used to uh, group together two prayers: the midday prayer and the one in the late afternoon prayer. And likewise, the one, the, the, the prayer we perform, we call Maghrib, the sunset prayer, and the one late at the night. He used to group it together. Even in a, if you are traveling, you can, uh, uh, you can shorten your prayer. It's not like, you know, uh, perform it is normally we perform. You can do that. So there, there are. So you mean two or three times rather than five times? Three times, yes, three times, yes. Uh, being being in America, myself, let me share with you, um, having limitations, time constraints, I usually do that. Not every day, but I do that. Um, when I feel that, you know, perhaps I may not be able to, to offer this late afternoon prayer um, because of my engagements, I uh, offer that with the, the midday prayer or the midday prayer with the late afternoon prayer and likewise the, the, the sunset prayer with the late night prayer. At what age does that begin? And do girls and boys participate in the um, practice? Uh, uh, I, I have um, a nephew who's friend during okay. high school. He would be at a party at our house and would take his mat out at at evening time and everybody was respectful and he found a, a quiet space amongst all whatever else was going on around the house. So I was wondering when does the practice begin? Is there any kind of... Uh, you, you mean to say uh, when, uh, when does the practice uh, for any individual begins? At what age? Yes. Sir. Okay. Uh, it's around 10-11. That's how. 10-11. 
well, you know, preferably that's the age where uh, the, the, the children, Muslims, usually Muslim families, in Muslim families, the children are, uh, are made to, the, the parents usually, uh, uh, you know, get them along for prayer. Yeah, to model them. Yeah, that's how it's done. Is there a feeling of guilt, if, um, whether you're young or old, of not, not <laughs> That's something very subjective. And uh, as I said earlier, I'll, I'm not a religious person. Religious person, I'm not a cl clergyman. You know, I'm a practicing Muslim. Mm -hmm. And I, I claim that I'm a, I'm a Muslim by choice. At any stage I would have found that it's not, I would have renounced. So, be telling you my experience and very honest opinion. Yes, I do feel the guilt when I fail to, I, I having a sort of a, you know, uh, but then we've been told uh, in the Quran, innahu kana tawwaba. Allah is the best of the forgivers. If you seek forgiveness, he's the one who doesn't mind you, you know, uh, forgiving you for, for your sins. And then, then there's, there's another uh, saying, as I earlier pointed out about the rights and duties of the, the creator and the creation and amongst the creations themselves. Allah says that I'll f forgive you if you have failed performing or uh, honoring my rights. But when it comes to rights amongst yourselves, a right of any human, you have failed, unless that human pardons you, I won't. So, yeah, I do feel, uh, uh, personally, sharing personal experience, I do feel, experience that feeling. Yes, Tim. So, so going off what Carolyn had asked, so no, Christian, you know, what we had Sunday school, hmm. where, you know, went to church prior before the actual service, where we learned about religion or, or God or the Bible, is there... A counterpart to that in Islam, where how do how do children learn about the Quran, about the principles? Is there a version of Sunday school, as we always call it? You know, um, is there that for Islam? Very good. Very. Uh, you know, it is something uh, uh, re uh, related to culture. Uh, we uh, sorry, we <laughs> we uh, usually come from a culture w where. Religion is mostly practiced. So the recitation of the Quran is done by the elders. You know, we do see the elders uh, uh, doing that. Um, they do tell us, uh, uh, instead of go, uh, sending us to a particular school or uh, a particular event on Sunday or Friday or any particular day, they doesn't happen exactly. It, it's, it started off within the family, generally speaking. Yes, um, uh, children are sent to, to the mosque to learn the Quran. Uh, it's, it's a, it has become a common practice. I personally and within my family, my, you know, my uh, uh, little uh, uh, nieces and uh, nephews, they go to a particular place learning the Quran from, uh, from a teacher. I learned it from my father. And my father was in the civil services. He used to uh, get off time pretty, you know, rarely. So I used to uh, sit with him um, after a week or a few days, you know, having those, those breaks. Um, uh, and um, uh, it took me a, a long time, <laughs> you know, I was in 8th grade when I, I was able to, uh, to, to complete the whole Quran, uh, but I done it. So, yeah, it, it's done uh, that way, uh, generally, largely. Yeah, sure. My name is Jennifer. I had some questions about, um, just as the art, there's no depictions of Muhammad or his family, where that kind of comes from, and also the sensitivity about the Quran and what's going on in Europe around those issues. I didn't get you an earlier question, earlier part of the question. Um, the first part of the question is, in art, we have a lot of Christian art that there's... Jesus okay, the, the, the images, and, yeah, the imagery. Yeah. The artwork and... Okay, the artwork. Hmm. Uh, 
again, uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, there's no restrictions in artwork as such. Uh, as far as the, 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 there is no uh, images of the, the prophet being available, perhaps my personal understanding is, and that has nothing to do with religious studies or um, because there were, there were uh, uh, perhaps uh, it was, uh, wasn't like for the fact that the people would, as in, the, in that clip it's been said that when the prophet passed away, some of the followers, they were not to believe it. Even one of the, the very close fellows of the Prophet, uh, who became later on um, uh, Umar, uh, Caliph Umar, uh, uh, um, a ruler of a great empire, then uh, he stood up and he said, if anyone said that Muhammad has died, I'll kill him. And Abu Bakr said, if you are, uh, you are worshipping uh, Muhammad, he's dead. He was a man and he's dead. And if you're worshipping God, God is alive. So that would have been the reason that people, you know, it, it, it has generally uh, in human history has happened. Did we start worshipping, we, we indulging in personality worshipping. So in order to avoid that personality worshipping, that would have been the reason. And that's, a, that's a, a layman's understanding. You know, that's my understanding, my approach to it. Um, but as far as arts is concerned, there is... Uh, uh, no such restrictions or you know it's not forbidden at all one more thing to the second part of why there is sensitivities about the, the imagery of uh, the prophet or uh, the Quran uh, you know <laughs> I, I feel that this is more to what we'll be discussing in the next lecture but you know I'll, I'll give you a bit of a it has got more to do with the rights and the duties the concept of right, what is the concept of rights? The concept of right is that uh, rights are universal, foremost. Rights are universal. Every human, irrespective of where he comes from, what region he comes from, she comes from, what religion they believe in, they don't, what caste, color, creed, lingual background they have, everyone is entitled to the same rights, isn't it? But the same people have the duty to respect the same rights of other people. So rights are not absolute. Rights are relative. If I'm saying something, that could be sensitive to your feelings. Who the hell I am to, to cause you pain, isn't it? That is transgressing my responsibility, my sphere of duties to you. I should be respectful. In the Quran, Allah says, Allah says, and it's been the, 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 the titles of the, 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 the deities being mentioned in the Quran. Allah has stated in the Quran, even if they abuse me, you don't abuse their false gods. Muslims being told, don't abuse their false gods. You are not to do that. Muslims being forbidden from abusing their false gods. To respect, as I said earlier, you know, I claim myself a humanist, a, a liberal, a secular, and I understood these concepts from Quran. Quran has told me, like Rahafiddin, there is no compulsion in, power, in, 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 in uh, ex, uh, following a religion. You cannot compel anyone to, to believe in what you believe in. Not at all. That's, that's, Lakum deenukum wal yadeen. The Prophet's been told, commune, convey to them. Lakum deenukum wal For you is your path, for us is ours. And the Quran, you know, we've been, uh, Allah says it's beautiful ayah. When Moses was sent to, uh, to, to Pharaoh, he'd been told, and you got to speak with him with uh, uh, politeness. Speak to, to Pharaoh politely. Allah says. So, 
there are sensitivities. We must be respectful to each other's freedoms. If I'm sensitive, no matter what it is, what's the background is, uh, is a human, that's my right to be respected, isn't it? And I, as a human, I understand that others have sensitivities as well. For example, uh, there are people who are sensitive to Holocaust. I must be respectful to them, isn't it? That's how I, I see it. So, um, I've always been interested in Sufism and I think the, you know, the whirling dervishes and I just think yeah. But um, I've also read that some um, Muslims, um, they're persecuted um, Sufism for some reason. They follow the Quran, right? Taliban. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, yeah. Yeah. Um, particular uh, people uh, uh, professing a particular version an understanding of their own. Yes, there have been persecution, uh, per persecutions of people. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're right. Yeah, I'd like to learn more about that. And one other question, if I may, um, I don't, um, uh, you mentioned the oneness of God and the dignity of humankind quite a bit throughout the um, lecture. Um, is there anything in the Quran that talks about um, other parts of nature, animals, respect for um, all other creations besides God and humans? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, let me give credit for this uh, topic to, to Jim. It was Jim's decision to, uh, he came up with the idea of I should give. You know, he, he asked me to share some topics with him. And whatever topics I had, uh, uh, themes I had shared with them, he rejected them all and he brought this topic. And he told me that this, these, uh, these two lectures from the summers, these be, these be, and this is, it's an answer to your question, last part of your question. Uh, this be a prelude to our, the, the course for the fall semester. So we have a very detailed course about environment, sustainability, and how Islam responds to these problems. So how Islam responding to, uh, uh, Quran responding to uh, the scheme of nature and animals and plants and all the sustainability uh, uh, conundrum uh, um, that we'll be discussing in detail. And I hope you'll be part of the, the, the series, of course. Um, uh, Sufism, uh, mysticism uh, has a place, a great place in Islam. In fact, uh, you know, I come from the subcontinent. Uh, we believe that the subcontinent um, owes much to the 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 the, uh, the history of Sufis uh, who travel this this part of the the, the world. Uh, it was because of them that Islam spread in the subcontinent. Um, uh, they um, preached love, professed love, love for mankind. Uh, uh, for, for, for people across cultures, uh, religions, irrespective of their uh, backgrounds. Uh, that was the true message of Islam. So again, their persecutions been, uh, you know, uh, been caused by people trying to uh, um, serve their own interest by defining um, religion in a manner which suits their uh, uh, their interests, uh, you know, to, uh, the, the mostly as a student of political science, uh, it's a, we, we say in political science that the, the entire pro, uh, problem is about the power to control power to have power to have sway of everything. These people, in order to create fear, to 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 show to the people that they are the ones who are superior, who can, their uh, dogma, uh, their philosophy must be accepted. They uh, um, uh, resort to actions uh, which of extreme nature, uh, persecution of people as well, su Supis as well. Yeah. I think we'll do one, one last question and then just be respectful of people's time. Yes. Sure. Good. You mentioned uh, two uh, Karen Armstrong books that you were going to And Leslie Hazelton. Yeah. 
I'll, I'll share the details of uh, these with you. Along with these slides, I'll be sharing the, the, about the writers as well. I mean, uh, I'm having uh, two of the books, right, yeah, if you could give me. I'll be sharing the details, the, the, the references as well. Uh, this is uh, uh, a copy of the Quran uh, by uh, uh, one scholar from India, Molana Wahiduddin Khan, uh, and it's written in English. It's the entire uh, script is written in English. You know, there's no Arabic. It's written. It's like, you know, even for myself, I found it extremely easy traveling, reading the book. It has become extremely uh, feasible, comfortable. This is Karen Armstrong's book, uh, Muhammad, A Prophet of Our Time. Uh, this is another book, a very, uh, uh, the, the book that uh, uh, brought fame to her, history, a history of God, yes. a history of God, uh, the 4,000 years quest of Judaism, Christianity and Islam, a history of God, a history of God, uh, 4,000 years of Judaism, Christianity and Islam. Uh, thank you so much. I see we're over time just a little bit, which is completely fine. Thank you, folks. Wonderful questions. Thank you for engaging each other and our wonderful speaker. Thank you. And we'll be back next week to kind of continue the conversations with the um, Islam and Ethics. I forget the yeah. exact title we're doing. Yeah. That's Islam and Ethics. Yeah. yeah. How Islam sees the concept of ethics. So, so folks, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, we hope to see you. Bring friends next week if you're coming. And we'll see you soon.